This is $60.59. This is the Thermalright Frozen Prism that we bought on Amazon because it is one of the cheapest liquid coolers of a basically name brand that's available on the internet. It has a non-RGB LED variant for even cheaper, technically. Uh, $56.90 for that one. Right into the cool stuff, this is our 3D laser scan. You can see that it has a heavy focus on a protruding area of the cold plate centrally towards the IHS. We'll talk about this later. This should benefit its cooling by focusing contact on the area where the silicon is. Confusingly, Thermalright also has several liquid coolers at similar prices, and a lot of them were released in the same plus or minus one year window. It has the Thermalright Frozen, uh, is that, a, is that Italian maybe? Note. It's got the Aqua Elite, the Frozen Infinity, the Mjolnir Vision, Core Vision, the Warframe Pro, the Warframe Black X. That one's Super Gamer. It both has an X and is named Black. It has the Frozen Guardian and then three more pages of variations on these. As you can see by these pages, Thermalright's strategy has been to completely swarm the market with cheap solutions. Thus far, those solutions have been extremely competitive on performance as well. At least that's if you look at the air coolers, which we've generally liked from Thermalright so far. The Peerless Assassin has been one of our top recommendations for an air cooler since we bought it uh, a year or two ago now. And now we're going to look at one of the cheapest but still name brand liquid coolers on the market, which is the Frozen Prism. And oddly, its price competition is somehow more in line with air coolers than it is with other competing liquid coolers. The Scythe Puma 3 is around 50 bucks. The Thermalright Peerless Assassin is 35. The Noctua NHU-12S Redux is somewhere in that 50 to 55 dollar range as well. So this will be an interesting one. We brought you this video with store.gamersnexus.net. We've recently added a ton of stock over on the store, including our brand new PC case badge magnets. These are a pack of three, featuring a two-scale Ryzen CPU badge, an Intel LGA case badge, and a GN logo, all with depth. If you want something functional, check out our PC building anti-static mod mats in the GN15 design which features PC building diagrams, pinouts for things like Ethernet wiring, two-scale DRAM references, and a screw tracking grid to help you build your next computer. It serves as a heavy-duty rugged surface to protect the table and your PC parts. We also have our heavy-duty soldering mats with high heat resistance, screw tracking trays molded into the silicone, tool holders, and spool holders. This is all useful for projects like model building, or soldering of course, or as recently pointed out to us, Lego building. Support our independent reviews and efforts to purchase ever more review hardware by grabbing something from us on store.gamersnexus.net. Thermalright, it's undercutting major brands significantly. The big difference though with liquid coolers that we are a little bit uncertain of is the endurance. If an air cooler works well in the review process, it probably will work well basically forever. It's not likely to have any kind of long-term failures. It's just a big piece of metal, maybe the fan. But even if the fan fails, as reviewers, we're not too worried about it if it's something that would happen far in the future where we can't reasonably predict it because, in the very least, they're cheap to replace. Liquid coolers, though, can have issues with gunk buildup, corrosion, pump failures, uh, flux and soldering issues in the radiator, and gunk buildup is the main concern that happens somewhat frequently on liquid coolers on the market from chemical imbalances or poor flux work in the radiators. It's not something we can evaluate in a review. And we're front loading that consideration here because it just seems like the price would have to include some kind of downside. It doesn't mean it will or that it's guaranteed, but we want everyone to be aware of the limitations of a review up front, which in this case, the performance is easy to test. It's that endurance that we really don't have a window into until it's been on a machine for at least six months, but probably more like one to two years, uh, which is the point typically you would start to see some of the signs of gunk buildup. So we can't evaluate that aspect today. The price has us a little suspicious, but who knows? Maybe it's fine. On the other hand, too, uh, if you're okay with rolling the dice on it and then replacing it in a year or whatever for the same price, which would still be cheaper than most liquid coolers on the market, that's certainly an argument that Thermal Right could make. All right, let's get into the basics. The cooler has a standard thickness radiator. It's about 25 millimeters or 27 when counting that outer shell. It's 120 by 396 millimeters for the actual radiator size. And so Thermal Right isn't doing what the likes of Arctic or Height are doing by tweaking other dimensions to boost performance. 
This is what we would call dimensionally standard for a liquid cooler. It also has a rat's nest of cables. It has six total coming out of the fans for the 360 model and another two out of the pump block. Thermalright doesn't give any of the modern ease of installation features. It doesn't have any fancy daisy chaining solutions and it really shouldn't be expected that it have any of those at $60 or sorry, $56.90 for the non-RGB variant. These fans are TLE12V2s, which have a maximum rated speed of 1850 RPM. Thermalright uses plastic hose clamps to help keep the tubes closer together. It has silver colored plastic joints at the barbs, and it uses a pump cap with RGB LEDs of a Thermalright logo and illuminated octagonal light bar. And that's enough of the basics. The cooler doesn't have a lot going on, and that's fine, it's cheap. That's the interesting part. We know everyone just cares about the performance, so we're gonna get straight into it. For this testing, we're using both AMD and Intel heat loads. The Intel heat load we're using today is 250 watts. We ran that one for our Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 evaluation, and we pulled it back out to use for this one. So that has a limited amount of coolers on it, but we actually have been building an Intel data set recently, and we'll be running that soon, probably for the NHD 15 G2 review. You'll see a ton of Intel numbers on there. But uh, the AMD heat load has dozens of coolers, so we'll start with that one. Starting with a noise normalized 200 watt heat load on AMD, and then we'll move to the Intel testing. With all coolers using their included fans and set to the same target noise level, the Prism 360 ends up behind the Liquid Freezer 3 by about three degrees. In the world of coolers, this is a big gap, but overall, the fact that a 60-ish dollar cooler is anywhere near the top is impressive. Long-term viability or not, the cooler is performing pretty well for its price. Anyway, the frozen prism is about equal to the Liquid Freezer 3 when it's in a reduced to 80 millimeters size. The closest air cooler on this chart is actually Thermalright's own Peerless Assassin at 56 degrees delta T over ambient pushed below all of the liquid coolers. We've become used to every generation's newest and highest end liquid cooler being a new chart topper. In this instance, being anywhere near the other liquid coolers is an accomplishment for this cheap cooler, and it's certainly no chart topper, but it's definitely competitive. 100% fan speed on all coolers is up now. Thermalright's frozen prism hits 53 dBA here with our prior noise testing methods, which has it louder than the now banned Deep Cool Mystique 360 and significantly louder than the not banned Arctic Liquid Freezer 3 360, which was about 40 dBA in this testing process. That's a big noise advantage for the Arctic solution, and thermally, it's within error of Thermalright's frozen prism. So the Liquid Freezer 3 is definitely a substantially better cooler than the frozen prism, and depending on if they're doing their promotional pricing or their uh, quote-unquote permanent pricing, that would mean a competing Liquid Freezer 3 is anywhere in the range of two times the price of the Frozen Prism 360, plus or minus, say, 20 bucks day to day. Even still, the Prism does okay to brute force its position. It manages a top rank despite achieving it in an acoustically inefficient way. In a quick test with a 250 watt Intel LGA 1700 heat load, we found the Frozen Prism to perform about the same as the Deepcool Mystique and its quieter solution. The Liquid Freezer 2 420 is noticeably quieter at 100% fan speeds, down at around 45 dBA, and was less than two degrees warmer than the Frozen Prism when using the Thermalright contact frame. Using a frame isn't like for like though. Comparing with the Intel ILM, the LF2 420 ran at 63 degrees to the Frozen Prism's 57, which has the advantage of running louder, but the disadvantage of radiator size. The Liquid Freezer 3 exhibits the issues we mentioned in our new review of the Arctic Cooler, where the contact frame is not allowing ideal contact with the LJ1700 solution and is falling behind in some ways. Still, the 360 model at least managed a 58.8 degree result at a substantially and noticeably quieter noise level at 100% as compared to the Frozen Prism. The perceived difference to the human ear would be about two times louder. With the Frozen Prism at 35 dBA, it ran 65 degrees peak core and 58 all core average over ambient. That means the Liquid Freezer 3 at 39.8 dBA has about a 6.2 degree advantage although it is louder here in this direct comparison. This data set was intended to be for a limited time while we move over to our new numbers, so it's relatively slim compared to the AMD numbers. Uh, we have new LGA 1700 data running in a week or so. Next up, we get into some really cool stuff. Our laser scanner will give us a look at the Thermalright Prism. The laser scanner is an industrial tool that we bought for evaluating cold plate design. Factories use this for tolerances in their manufacturing process. It looks at IHS curvature or convexity and concavity and device flatness, like 
for cold plates. We got really heavy use out of this machine recently when we tested some custom made golden sample cold plates for Intel and AMD. You should really check that video out if you haven't. It's an engineering deep dive and it does some really cool stuff. And you can support our purchasing of equipment like this and our use of it by going over to store.gamersnexus.net and grabbing some of our brand new PC case badges, which include a uh, actually two scale AMD Ryzen CPU and an Intel LGA 1700 CPU. And those magnets will look great on your steel panels for your cases. All right, so for the thermal right frozen prism, you can see at 1x zoom, the central area is curved towards the laser, indicated by that red part of the heat map. That'd make it convex towards the CPU, which is typically concave for Intel CPUs after being clamped. We showed that in our IHS scans previously for the scythe content. At 100x magnification, you can see that the entire center of the cooler protrudes towards the CPU IHS. This is obviously magnified to exaggerate it, but it helps illustrate the point. It also helps explain some of the stronger performance in some of the tests we looked at. Now we get to pressure scans. These are taken with a special chemically reactive paper and then scanned using a special software and scanner combination. The end result allows us to evaluate the pressure applied to the IHS by the cold plate when under the mounting force of the cooler's included mounting hardware. So effectively, it's an evaluation of the mounting hardware, not just the cold plate. We'll start on the AMD platform. Here, we observed super high pressure almost circularly around the middle of the IHS. This appeared on both CPUs we tested. That high central pressure is what we recently found to produce the best performance when we did our Scythe Cold Plate Engineering Deep Dive. And on Intel, the pressure scans showed good contact across the center channel of the IHS. It's lacking on the far sides nearest the ILM clamp points, but the cold plate is making good contact to everywhere the silicon is present. This high pressure across the die explains the performance that we saw earlier. That plus the louder fans when at 100% load. Before we get into the conclusion, we'll look at the installation process of this with Mike. Okay, we're going to start with AMD first here. So the first step with AMD is we're going to remove the stock mounting brackets. All right, once those are off, we've got four standoffs that go over the protruding part of the back plate. I'll just slide those into position here. Okay, and then once those are in place, we're going to place our bracket down, and then we'll secure it with these two screws. And I'm just going to get those started, and then I'll tighten everything down here in a second. And then once the thermal paste is on there, we'll go ahead and place our cold plate down on top of the IHS and get these two nuts screwed onto their respective threads. And I'm just going to alternate side to side here, a few turns each so that I get a nice even pressure. All right, and that's it for AMD. Now let's take a look at Intel. Um, I'm actually gonna do away with the bench here for this first part of the segment because the standoffs are a little finicky to get into place. So if we take a look at the back plate here, you got some logo labeling um, that we want facing away from the motherboard. So I'm gonna place it down like that. And then I'm gonna get our standoffs into place and we want the farther out position for LGA 1700. And I'm just going to get these tossed in there, and if they move around, I'll get them settled correctly here in a second. Okay, and those look good now. Now we're going to slide on these blue retaining washers. These will help hold the standoffs in place. Cool. And now we're going to slide our motherboard down into place. All right, and now we're going to place another set of the standoffs that go on top of the motherboard. And then the mounting brackets here have three positions as noted in the uh, manual, and we want that middle position for LGA 1700. And then four nuts to secure the two brackets. Okay. 
So that's the Intel hardware installed. Let's go ahead and put some thermal paste down and then secure the cooler. All right, just get these standoffs lined up with the retention bracket on the cooler. Get those started by hand. I'm going to alternate side to side to make sure we got nice even pressure as always. And these can be tightened until they stop. And that wraps up the Intel installation. So let's talk about some critiques and criticisms. Um, I think the only thing to be aware of with this cooler is that the tubes are a little stiff. It makes it potentially a poor candidate for a case that has some tight spaces. So that's something to keep in mind. That wraps up the installation segment. I'm gonna throw it back to Steve now. This review is about as straightforward as it can possibly get. So at $60, it is hard to beat thermally. And thermally, the cooler, it's not the best when considering the whole picture, like acoustics, but it's really not bad. And <laughs> that alone is a big positive when something is this cheap. It's like, again, half the price of one of the cheapest but best liquid coolers on the market. And it's a third of the price of a lot of the stuff that is more LED centric. One of the interesting things that came up during Computex this year, which is a, the industry's biggest convention, we were talking with all the different cooler manufacturers and a topic that came up repeatedly with the manufacturing reps without me prompting it was they don't understand how Thermalright can sell things at the prices they do. And the collective comment from competition came back to an uncertainty of how Thermalright's making any money at its prices, which in the very least shows that there is extremely small margin at $60, if any margin. It's possible they have some lost leaders out on the market. Uh, either way, though, from the consumer's perspective, it's cheap and it appears to be good with the asterisk there being long-term viability. As we showed a moment ago, the cooler uses a heavily convex cold plate to mate with the concave IHS of Intel, which seems to work for it. Its pressure patch is largely focused on the die area for both AMD and Intel. Acoustically, it's not a strong performer. And the frozen prism is weaker than competition when looking at the full picture of thermal results at a given noise level. But again, we keep coming back to the same simple thing, which is it's $60. Air coolers can't compete with liquid in scenarios like this, but the best ones to consider if you really wanted air instead would actually be a thermal right solution, which would be the Peerless Assassin 120 at $35 or so, or you can get into the $50 range with some of the single tower, weaker performing Noctua samples, the Scythe Fuma series, like the Fuma 3, and then this is where we would recommend Deep Cool uh, under the previous circumstances, but they have been snapped out of existence in at least the US, and it looks like most of the world coming soon. So we'll have to look at some other air coolers to see who will take their place. As for competing liquid coolers that we've tested, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 remains a GOAT, and the ARGB 420 mil variant has dropped to 100 bucks on Amazon, which itself is an amazing price. The real question is going to be the endurance, but again, maybe a roll of the dice on replacing a $60 cooler with another one isn't so bad. It depends entirely on your perspective. Uh, definitely there's a buy once, cry once mentality that in a lot of cases I would follow, but at the same time, if you're going for ultra budget, but can still cool something like an Intel solution that's running hotter, it does seem like the frozen prism is genuinely able to do that with some of the downsides and sort of asterisks we've mentioned throughout the video. But overall, we're impressed with it. You can check out all of our cooler reviews in the mega charts on gamersnexus.net. We have every single cooler we've tested for our AMD solution on there. We just updated it. And then we're working on adding some of the new Intel testing as well. So go to gamersnexus.net. You can click on mega charts or scroll down to that second block of images. And that is a permanent page of reference for cooler reviews and thermal benchmarks, acoustics, book market or something, come back a uh, couple times a year and you'll see it's updated with the newest data. So that's got everything on there to get you up to speed. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameraxis.net to help fund our efforts directly, like our ongoing maintenance of the ad-free gamersnexus.net website with those mega charts. And uh, you can also support us by throwing us a few bucks on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. See you all next time.